it. And I need this. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, so good morning. Uh, I'm Sara, and currently I'm the, at the Botanical Garden in Rio de Janeiro. I'm actually sponsored by the National Institute of Mata Atlântica, in, which is in Espírito Santo, but I'm, I'm currently at the Botanical Garden. And I did my PhD here at the University of São Paulo with Paulo Inácio, and the main topic of my research is community ecology. But we do that in a slightly different way. We are thinking about concepts and theories and mostly statistical models. And there is a piece of theory that we really wanted to present because we couldn't leave a school in community ecology without showing how the theory is organized and how we biologists are thinking about the organization of theory. So I'll be talking about... Uh, Okay, the theory of community ecology, speci more specifically about the pattern of species abundance distributions, and I will show quickly uh, our case study. So the theory of community ecology, well, we have been here for the entire week, and we know that our main interest is to understand why do we find different species at different places with different abundances. If we track what are the hypotheses that generates patterns of diversity, there are 100. And actually, Palmer tried to count, and there is 120 hypotheses at that time. So when we have 120 explanations for something, it's really easy to think that things are a mess, and that we, it's really hard to understand how we go from the species pool to a community. Because of that, it was really common to that people would say those things, like community ecology is a mess, we are just collecting facts at the lab or at the field, and we have facts, 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 without a strong theoretical structure. It was okay to say that until the last century, okay? Now we have moved on, and we are thinking about how we can integrate different ideas and Models, it doesn't matter if they are mathematical or statistical or even just concepts. We are trying to integrate all of it in a concept that should not be more a black box, okay? So, Valent, in 2010, he reviewed all patterns and general processes that underlies diversity in biological communities. And he listed several patterns and he proposed an organization, so we shouldn't think about this as a black box, but he proposes that community ecology is driven mainly by four main processes. So after his paper, he wrote this book, which is a more detailed argumentation of his ideas. It also has, um, it's really good for teaching, and also has a lot of R code to simulate and see, make like, computer experiments to see how things go on. And he was concerned about mainly two things. One of them is how are we teaching community ecology, and that, that is one of his inspirations to write the book. But he was also thinking about how we can organize theory under big concepts. And this implies, and he starts his book, with the exercise of convincing biologists to ignore details. So we are always, it's, it's intrinsic of how we started doing natural sciences and natural history, and biology is really uh, attached to detail. And that is very different from physics, physicists. So it might sound weird for the physics that we have different process, process, and process, and sort of all, all of these patterns, and a posterior, we decided how to organize it. But that's how we are doing, okay? And it seems all right. <laughs> uh, his idea is, to, is that communi communities are driven by these four processes. And basically, you have local, regional, and global communities. They are driven by speciation, drift, and selection. And they interact with, with each other by this person. So, just to make clear these four concepts, 
when you th we think about selection, we are thinking about differences in fitness between individuals of different species. Uh, so this implies in selections among individual, individuals of different species, and also trait-based selection. Dispersal is the movement of organisms from one place to another, and this means, this implies that communities are not independent, and also this is a process that adds new, new species to the community, and also is related with the loss of individuals as well. And speciation is a broader process that adds new, new species to the global system, and results in special variation in species diversity. And he argues that it is the result of some combination of the other process, selection, drift, and dispersal. At a time scale of multiple generations. So it's something that we usually call an evolutionary scale. This is debatable, but it's easy to think that those processes occur, and after multiple generations, we can see selection. What is important here is that these processes interact with, with, with each other and they operate at different scales. And this is the proposal, this is his organization, and it helps us to situate ourselves. And when we are doing a logical Volterra model or, uh, I don't know, coexistence theory, we are under the concept of selection, for instance. And if we think about other theories in communi community ecology, we should be under one or more of these concepts. In, in the book, he tries to organize common theories in ecology under these this general processes, but what is important is that we can make the exercise of generalizing and having those four high-level processes that drives biological communities. So this is a really good exercise for us to think where we are and how we can organize theory. So we couldn't leave a community ecology school without mentioning his work. Of course, it is debatable, but that's how we organize theory. And at least it was a very good effort to make people stop saying that community ecology is a mess. And OK. So next thing, we will talk about the pattern of species abundance distributions. We have already seen this during the week. So we have basically here different forms of presenting species abundances, uh, distributions. Here we have like species ranked from the most abundant to the least abundant. And here we have abundance at a log scale. Abundance can be biomass, number of individuals. It can be the rel relative abundance. Here we have an entire community. What this shows us is that we have lots of rare species and a few abundant species. This is more easily to see in this kind of uh, presentation in, in which we have like a really high bar for the rare species. Here is the meta community and here we have three different communities. So we can see that even if the meta community follows a particular pattern, you can see differences in local communities. And this is due to variation in the dominance. So here we have more dominance. We have two species that are very abundant and only one rare species. In contrast, here we have lots of rare species. There's also the differences in richness, but it's an easy way to track differences across time and, in, and space. And well, we know that species vary across time and space. And one idea of how species abundance vary across time was proposed by Maguhan and Henderson. And they proposed the idea of core and satellite species based on the persistence through time. And they do some statistics to separate the abundance. Here are the core, here are the uh, satellites. It's the opposite. Here are the core, here is the satellite species. You have here the species abundance distributions for the entire community. And what, what they, they saw is that core and satellite species follow different distributions. So you have here the core species, and you have much more uh, species with high numbers of individuals than the satellite species. So core species are abundant over time, and satellite species are rare over time. 
and they follow just different distributions. So this is one way to and understand differences in abundance through time. Another way that we study species abundance distributions is their variation across environmental gradients. This is the classical work from Whitaker. And here uh, he's showing each curve is the abundance of a particular species. In the x-axis, we have the gradient, the environmental gradient. And we can see that some species respond to the environmental gradient differently. And if we are thinking about selection, uh, building communities, we can think that uh, dealing with environmental gradients is really useful and we learn it a lot looking into environmental gradients. So ecology is about variation and Jacopo made that point. Uh, yeah, like also talk about the, this today. And one of the main issues is how do we quantify it? So we are not approaching this using math. We are quantifying variation and we are describing variation using statistical models. Here's a linear regression. We can think about the abundance of a species I at a site J and this would follow a linear, it will have a linear function of some variable X that could be the environment. And this is really useful because we can deal with different error distributions of the abundance and the function can linear, linearize many functions. Um, what is important here is that we have, in here in this equation we have, it, it's basically a mathematical equation with an error. And using statistics we can actually uh, describe this error and there are techniques for doing that. For instance, mixed models in which we can actually model the random stru structure of the error. And there are several approaches that try to do that using basically trait environment co correlations, using the error structure to model the variance related to the environment and, the, and abundances. And I think that the most important thing here is to understand that we can model those errors um, in different levels of variation. Some people already did a lot of work on that and this is also the base of the work that we developed during my PhD. So I'll talk about our case study that we are basically trying to understand species abundance distributions using trait environmental co correlations and those statistical models. Let me take. Those are the people involved in the work. There's Paulo and Alexandre. Alexandre is a professor at, at the University of Sao Paulo. He works with tropical ecology and a lot of statistical models. And Jefferson and Mateus, they are both botanists and they are specialists in ferns, which is the study system that we used. I, during my master's, I worked with fern community ecology in the field, describing abundance of species on mountains in, in a tropical forest as well. So it was a group that I, I knew and these people are the best specialists in the group here in Brazil and it was really important to know the group and to work with people that really know the system so that we could think about what we can ignore about the system. So it was a really good exercise to work both with botanics and ecologists and I'm a bit in between, I'm much more ecologist than a botanist, but I, I was used to the system. So we are trying to understand species abundance and we were specifically interested in separating the effects of drift and selection. And for us, at least for me, and I can not say for everybody, but for me in the group, but when I think about the community, I'm thinking about a tropical forest. So you can pick your favorite community, it can be microbes, it can be a matrix, it can be birds, it can be whatever. Um, but the thing is that we won't work with that detail. For us, a community is just a set of species that occur in a particular place. But it doesn't matter the identity of the species, but if we are trying to understand the response of species abundances to the environment, it is really important to take into consideration species traits. So we selected some traits, 
of ferns that we think that would respond to the environmental gradient that we were interested. And basically, in order to separate the effects of drift and selection, what is important is that um, here is, a, is a species abundance distributions. In this side is the expectation of what we would have if drift was the main processes affecting community assembly. Here we have species, the color represents a particular trait. So if drift is the most important process affect, affecting abundance of a community, we wouldn't expect any correlation of species traits with their abundances. In the opposite side, if we are thinking about an environment where selection is important, uh, we would expect a co correlation of species traits with their abundance. It doesn't mean that uh, here we, we still see some variation. So variation is intrinsic, and one of the things that we are interested in is to understand more about this variation, but still things are not only just drift and selection. All these processes occur at the same time. And the big challenge that we started asking was can we quantify the influence of both selection and drift in community assembly? So we decided to test which combination of those uh, mechanisms drives species abundance in local community. And we were, we were thinking about an environmental gradients. The data that we have, this data was collected by Mateus and Jefferson. And they went to three different mountain ranges, and they sampled all um, communities from the sea level to the top of the mountains. And this is a gradient. I think the only thing that we, it matters here is that it's a gradient in which we have the extremes with uh, harsher conditions, and in between we have mild conditions. Okay, and we were thinking about traits that would co correlate with the environmental variation. We had they sampled almost 20,000 individuals from 153 species and of ferns. So ferns, they are plants, vascular plants. They do not have seeds or fruits. Uh, they reproduce through spores. I don't know if it's, we can see here. The spots here are, spo are spores. And we have a great variety of life forms. So this, is what, this was one obvious trait. So you, we can have three ferns. We can have epiphytic ferns that are ferns that grow on tree trunks. Uh, those are all epiphytes. epiphytes. You, can, you can have terrestrial herbs also. This is really interesting because it's a fern that grows on uh, tree ferns, specifically on tree ferns. And another trait that we had to consider, uh, when, when we started thinking about the group, we thought about several traits related to water storage and, and everything. But we end up with only two traits that were the traits that really matter to abundance. And another trait that is important is uh, laminar thickness, the leaf thickness. So we have an example here of a very um, thick leaf and a very thin leaf here. So those species have different environmental requirements and preferences, and we wanted to understand that. So the way we were doing that is that we were, first of all, we were separating species into core and uh, occasional species. And for us, we are working with a spatial, in a meta community especially, not on time. But we saw that we had a lot of species that were very abundant in, at all sites. A lot, no, we had less species that were really abundant at all sites, and a lot of species that were really rare. And we couldn't model those species using the same distribution, so we separated them. We were using linear mixed models to actually uh, describe variance, and also we were using an R-squared metric to better quantify the variance, proportional of var variance explained by each effect. So this is, here is only a diagram of how we were thinking of building our framework. So we can think about uh, the abundance of a species along an environmental gradient. And this is a species that grows in abundance as we grow in the gradient. It can be any gradient. 
Uh, here we have the environmental gradient, but it doesn't affect species abundance. And we have three, but species abundance vary within different regions. So what we were thinking is that we want to model the mean response and also we want to model this variation, okay? And we can also have a combination of these two scenarios. So you have a response to the environment and you also have differences among regions and this, to model this structure is a bit different than to model this structure. But the way we are doing is that we are combining different effects in the models to model all, not all the possible, but the, the variances that, were, that we think that matter the most. So from this idea, we derived it for a hypothesis because we were interested in testing if communities were more driven by selection or drift. So it can be only selection, it can be only drift, a combination of both, and we also had a known model. So about selection, here, it doesn't matter, this notation is the notation that we are using to build the models in R, but what matters here is the meaning of each term. I won't go through all the terms, but I will just uh, highlight the most important things in, in each hypothesis. So for the, for the selection, we have basically the interaction among species traits and the environment, and also random variation associated with the gradient and species. But we could be measuring the wrong traits, for instance. And this is very common, and this is a big discussion in functional ecology. So in order to take that into account, we also built a model in which we were modeling only the response of, of species through the environmental gradient, and we used a random effect to take into account variation in species abundances following the gradient, but not related to traits. So this term that is in bold here uh, it, it would be a term that would catch if we are adding wrong traits in our models. Uh, and this is the hypothesis for selection, and the hypothesis for drift is that what affects the species abundance is, is only uh, limited dispersal. And we would have, since we have three different regions, and we have localities within regions, we would have random, um, limited dispersal within sides and within mountains. So we had those, all those terms to take into that account. And we built a mo a mo another hypothesis using a combination of, of them. And this is basically, we are putting everything that is in selection, everything that is in drift, and we make two combinations of uh, those models. So for selection drift, we will also have uh, a model to take into account for the wrong traits. And we have a model that we are calling idiosyncratic, it's just a known model in which abundance varies. There's no mechanism here, so this is just random variation. When we have drift, we have a mechanism behind it that is limited dispersal. That's the difference between them. This is the result, so let me take a sip of water. Well, we separated species into core and occasional, and what we saw is that occasional species, they are driven by a mixture of selection and drift. Uh, selection is just a tiny proportion of it. It's much more driven by drift, but we still see some sort of selection for the core species. For the occasional species, they are driven only by drift uh, and limited dispersal. Yeah? Here we have an example of the response. So here we have mean abundances, and the error bar is, is the observed error, and here in gray is the prediction for our model. So from this point to there, we have the prediction for the selection drift model, and here we have the prediction for the drift only model. Uh, here is the example of the response of a species to the environment. We allow the environment to have this unimodal uh, response, and what we see is that for the core species, we can see that the intermediate parts of the uh, gradient is where we can find the species with more abundance. And occasional species know that the x are really different, the y-axis here, and we, they not only occur with less number of individuals, but also their responses vary among the different, those are the different regions, so these are replicates, so we would expect the same response as we see here, 
And we don't see that for the occasional because they are mainly being driven by drift. But one thing, okay, we submitted this paper several times, one of the times, the re reviewer said, okay, this is really cool, I think you got something here, but can, how can you convince me that the terms that you say that are capturing drift are, are really capturing drift and not other random variation? And also, they asked about the thing about the wrong trait, so that's when we added the term for the wrong trait. So, what we did here is that we simulated communities that we know that are driven only by selection and only by drift, and we applied our modeling framework. I forgot to say that we used model selection to choose the best model that would explain, uh, that the, better explain the data. And when we do that for the communities that we simulated, uh, and here we have a determinist community that is mainly driven by selection, a stochastic community, here is the proportion of variance explained by selection or drift. So for stochastic community, we have that all the variation is actually being explained by drift. And for the determinist community, it is, most of variation is being explained by the fixed effects and the effects that represent selection. Here we have a component, a random component that is important here, that is the variation uh, within species. So, it's, it's like the, the species that one distribution that I showed as our prediction. So on average, a particular ecological strategy is successful, so species would be more abundant. But there's still random variation within species that share the same trait. That is normal, that's reasonable to think, and this is also occurring even when we are simulating uh, the communities. And then we simulated communities, those are communities only, um, driven by drift, but we simulated with what we are calling here right and wrong traits, are traits that are co correlated with the environment or not. So right traits are correlated with the environment and the wrong traits not. So what we see here is that even though the best models for those are the models based on selection, what we have here is that we have a different, so most of the variance when we have the wrong traits goes to this term that represents the interaction of the species with the gradient. So it means that species respond to the gradient, but not through only the environment. There's something there that we are missing. So this was really useful, and hopefully we can convince people that this is actually working. <laughs> so my main points here was to show you that community ecology is not a mess. So we are trying to organize theories, ideas, and concepts through a frame framework, and we all should stop for a moment and think if this works, and if this does not work, what we can propose. And, okay, this is not new, but general pa patterns are ruled by a combination of processes, and what is really new is that we can describe variation from different processes by playing with the random effects in the mixed models. So, hope that I brought a little bit more to fill this path that is the theory of community ecology, and then we can fill this with ideas, concepts, and models. So, thank you. I think we have time for one question. Thank you for the talk, it was very inspiring. And uh, I was wondering if you could also use this species abundance distribution, but using the traits instead of the, the species. Oh, wait, maybe I didn't explain right, because we are actually using traits. Mm -hmm. So when we, think, we are thinking about selection, we are thinking about the effect of species traits with interacting with the environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we measure different traits that we are calling an ecological strategy. And what we are seeing, we are modeling individual species abundances. What we are not thinking about individual species, we are thinking in a functional group level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's thank the Sarah again.
Pusle. Hello? 20 minutes, plus <coughs> 10 minutes of questions, so when you are at 20, I'm going to that. Ah, okay, great. <coughs> uh, so, hello, thank you for staying today longer to see our talks. And uh, my name is Marina, and I'm, is this loud enough? And uh, I'm a postdoc at the, at the University of Oldenburg, but I decided to talk about the chapter of my PhD which is uh, about species competition, because we heard a lot about species competition this week. And I'm going to talk about it from a more community ecologist uh, perspective. And I guess I tricked you all into staying here, because I did not say that the data that I'm going to use is uh, from Plutonic foraminifera. But actually, these methods that I use can be applied for any other uh, group that has similar data. No? Uh. So uh, just a quick uh, overview of what the group is. Plantonic foraminifera, they are unicellular eukaryotes, so protists, and they live as plankton in the marine uh, pelagic zones. And they have uh, actually quite a limited diversity. We know that there are 50 species living in the oceans today, and they are very cosmopolitan. So you can find them in all the oceans in the world, and you can find the same species in the North Pole and in the South Pole. What is really cool about them is that they build these shells, and when they die, these shells, they sink down and they accumulate on the ocean floor. And basically, you can sample the ocean floor, and you can uh, identify the species by their morphology, and this has been also uh, confirmed genetically that these morphospecies are genetic species. And, uh, and they have, a very, uh, they have a very good fossil record. So they are th the group with the best fossil record currently known. And I was interested during my PhD to know if Plantonic foraminifera species compete. And you may be asking why, and why this group, and why, why, why should I care? So I'm going to bring you quickly to another field of biology, which is called macroevolution, just to explain why I was interested in this question. And macroevolution is basically looking at the diversification of uh, sort of big groups of species, big, so clades that share a common ancestor. And you look at these diversification patterns through very long time scales, so millions of years. And uh, you can plot sort of this, so this is a phylogenetic tree of birds in this case. And what uh, macroevolutionary macro -evolutionary biologists usually do is that they plot the lineages through time to try to understand the diversification dynamics of the group. So basically, you just plot how many lineages you have at each given time here, and you try to understand what's causing sort of a, uh, this sort of rate of uh, diversification. So sorry, here's number of species and uh, time in millions of years. And this is, uh, we have like around 10,000 uh, bird species currently living today. So when we do this for the Plantonic foraminifera phylogeny, we see that you can see also groups that were extinct, that don't exist today anymore. And this is very unique for groups that have very good fossil record. So when you plot the LTT plot for Plantonic foraminifera, you don't see sort of this exponential increase. You see more like sort of a, uh, logistic uh, growth uh, in species number. And this has generated quite a big debate in macroevolution of whether there are ecological limits to diversification. So basically, what controls the number of species within a group, within a clade, through billions of years. And the two extremes of the debate are whether this is unbounded and that actually the number of species is defined by sort of big extinctions events, or if there's actually sort of a self limitation within the clade and the group that you just have a sort of a limited number of niches available and that species then compete for this niche space, compete for this niche space. So Plantanic foraminifera have been quite central in this debate because they're a very good example of 
sort of this self-limiting uh, increase of number of species. And this has been published uh, sort of quite a lot. And competition among species is the main mechanism proposed to explain this pattern. However, uh, so from paleontology and macroevolution, we think that, that competition was a very important mechanism driving the diversification of platonic foraminifera. But we actually cannot really test that in the fossil record, and we don't really know if they are competing today in the oceans and what patterns we would expect to see if they were or not. So that's why I was interested in testing why platonic foraminifera compete. So, well, ideally, sorry, coming back here, ideally, uh, if I could, I would try to test it in many different ways, right? I would try to do experiments in the lab and put one species by itself, with, and then add species and try to see how they interact. Also, I would do like field experiments, I would put like big aquariums in the ocean and try to exclude one species and see what happens in the dynamics. But unfortunately, I cannot do this with Plantonic foraminifera. They never were produced in the lab. Nobody has ever managed to make them reproduce in the lab. So there's no way of doing population dynamics experiments. And they live in the open ocean, and they actually occur in very low densities in the water column. So it's very unpractical to uh, do a field experiment or even observe them in the wild, because they're also really small. So what we do but, uh, when we have these uh, sort of problems in community ecology is that we look for patterns and we try to see whether the patterns would support uh, your hypothesis. So you, you see, in this case, I was looking for patterns that would support the idea that the species are competing. So I basically tested two patterns. Uh, one is a spatial pattern that is sort of local competitive exclusion, and the other one was a temporal pattern of compensatory dynamics, and I'm going to explain both of them. So the idea of the spatial pattern is, uh, this is not the best figure, so I'm already apologizing for it, but uh, if you have a community that is really dominated by competition, uh, species that are very ecologically similar, for example, suppose that these are two species, that's why I said that the figure is not uh, great. So we have six species, and these uh, species are all very limited by resources. So species that are very similar and use resources in a very similar way, they would end up excluding each other locally in the community, or at least occur in very disparate abundances. So I tested this idea using uh, this core top data that I explained the other day. So the Plantonic foraminifera, they live in the, in the water column. Their shells sink and accumulate in the ocean floor. And you can sample the top of this tube here as a proxy for sort of the co modern communities of Plantonic foraminifera. And there's about 4,000 samples of these around the world, which I tested sort of spatial patterns of species co-occurrences. So, but how do you measure, so you want to test whether species are more or less ecologically similar in the community. But what is ecological similarity? How do you measure that? And that's actually a bit related to the, what Sara was talking, that it's really difficult to know which traits you're really interested in, which traits are really important in the, in the, sort of in the mechanisms that you're interested in. But in my case, I cannot measure that many traits because they are uh, already dead, and also because we don't understand enough of their physiology and ecology to really know which type of traits would really drive uh, competition or, uh, yeah, so. So what I did is that I, I made the assumption that species that have similar shell sizes, they probably eat uh, similar resources and I would expect them to compete more strongly than, than species with very different size. Another proxy of ecological similarity that is, has been quite used, I think, in the last decade in community ecology is phylogeny. So you assume that uh, traits are conserved throughout evolution and that sister species or species that uh, diverge not that long ago, that they are more similar than species that diverge really long ago. So you, so, yeah, so that's sister species, and species that are closely related, they are ecologically more similar than species that, yeah. Uh, so, what you do is then you, try to, you want to test whether species are more similar or dissimilar than what would be expected by chance. And chance here is this idea of that communities are assembled by drift. 
And, uh, and what you do is then that you get your community sample and you have a, sort of a distance matrix that can be the phylogeny or can be the size differences between species pairs. And you sort of calculate the average and then you look whether this community, these species are more or less similar than you would expect by chance. So here, for example, if sort of, sorry, so I think I'm going to already pass. So, so if this, for example, if, if this trait is very important uh, for the environment that these species are living on, you would expect that when you sample this community, most species would have these traits. So that's the idea of environmental filtering. So if you measure a, a trait, a characteristic of a species that is very important to be adapted to dry systems, and if you go to a desert and measure the community that, there, you expect the species to have this trait and be sort of closer. That's how they call it in the sort of very more similar than you would expect. And on the other side, if species are competing very strongly, you expect species that are similar not to <coughs> co-occur locally. So you expect uh, to see an over-dispersed pattern. So what you do then to get what would be expected by chance is that you create a new model, which is by shuffling this distance matrix and sampling again this community sort of 100 times so that you get a distribution of what would be sort of the expected distance, uh, bit ecological similarity between species. And then you compare your observed sort of the average distance of the community to this new model. Is that clear? So here, for example, community A is very clustered, and community C is very over dispersed, and B would be somewhere in the middle. And this is called the community phylogenetics, and there's a very known R package that does this sort of uh, new models. So that's uh, what I did then for these communities. I used two different distance matrix. I used the shell size and phylogeny. And I actually measured, uh, so the software, the R package me measures the distance between individuals instead of species. So you actually take into account the abundance of species in the sample. So when I did this to, so each of these dots then is one sample. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say that you just, you standardize it by the mean and the standard deviation of the, of the new distribution, so you have the standard effect size. So when you plot, uh, when I plotted these results using the phylogenetic distance matrix or the shell size distance matrix, uh, what I saw is that most, sort of all communities, they just are not different than the new model. So if they were more clustered, you would expect to see some blue dots over here, which are, there are none. And if they were very over dispersed, which was the case of these two communities here, you would expect to see more species here. So this, this means that most species, they coexist regarding these two sort of traits that I'm measuring, the phylogeny and the, and the size. No? And there is not really a spatial structure regarding these two traits. Yes? So looking, so using these methods and these traits and trying to test for the spatial pattern, I did not find support for competitive exclusion. So yeah, there's no structure in the size or phylogeny of platoniferum. So then I thought maybe, maybe they are coexisting, but they, are, they have quite a marked uh, temporal dynamics. So you could expect that if species coexist, but they are still competing, uh, you would expect to see sort of a, whenever one species increases in abundance, it has a negative impact on the abundance of the other species. So that through time, you would expect to see sort of this compensatory dynamics. So for example, species A and species C here do, don't seem to be limiting each other, whereas species B can only increase in abundance when species A and species C are in low abundance. And I would like to, to repeat here that that doesn't, if I find this pattern, it doesn't mean that they are actually competing, but it would support the idea that they are. And then what you do is that you correlate this time series and sort of a negative correlation would be, would support sort of this compensatory dynamics. So I used a different type of data to do, do this. It's called sediment traps. I think Otto talked a little bit about it. So they're basically funnels that stay in the water column and they sort of, they capture settling particles in the water column. 
And they have these little tubes here that you can set to change every week or every two months, depending on your project. And then you get time series of species abundance, uh, yeah, of species abundances. So uh, there are many of these around the world, like 35. And I actually went in an expedition in my PhD and I could uh, see one of these being uh, moored. And so you can see it's like a one square meter here and here are the little tubes that I talked about. Uh, so basically uh, there were 35 sediment traps and 370 time series. So I'm saying that each species is a time series. And this is a bit how they look like. I'm sorry that this is not uh, in log scale. But the idea is that, uh, oops, sorry. The idea, sorry, so you can see that they're very seasonal. So here is time in years. And you can see that they have quite a marked peak throughout the year. So if I would just correlate these two time series, they would be positively correlated, but probably because they're constrained by seasonal variation of temperature. So what I did, and that was actually in collaboration with Breno, which is here from the group of Roberto, is that we thought about a new model that would uh, remove this this remove the correlation related to seasonality. So what we did is that we calculated the sort of we uh, calculated spline series, which is sort of the average. So is this black line? I'm not sure if you can see, but it's like an average population dynamics across the years. And then I separated for each species the spline series and the residual series. I shuffled these residuals and added it to the spline series, so I would have surrogate. Uh, time series, which I correlated, and I would get, again, a new distribution of how I would expect these species to correlate if they were just, just because of their seasonality and if these residuals did not really matter. Yes, yeah, that's clear. So then what you do, again, is you compare your observed correlation with this new distribution to see if that's significant or not. So, ah, so yeah, so here is, would be sort of the, in this case, the correlation and the no distribution. And uh, so what I found is that uh, I found more positive than negative correlation. So each, so here is again the standardized effect size. Each dot here is a species pair, sort of the, the correlation of the species pair taking into account this new model. And uh, I plotted, you can plot each species pair by their divergence time or difference in size just to see if there was a pattern related to these uh, traits. And what I found is that actually most species, they just, their season, seasonal cycles correlate, so they do not differ from the new model. But when they do, most of them are still quite synchronous in these uh, deviations from the seasonality. So most correlations were more positive than negative. So these are actually the conclusions. So I found no evidence that competition structures modern plantoniferaminifera communities. And sort of, it would be very interesting to have a bit of a, this school was really nice for me because you can see that these models are not really mechanistic, right? You just shuffle and you, you, you assume that this new model is really capturing all the mechanisms except the one that you're interested in and then you compare your your observed data to this new model. So it would be really nice to have more mechanistic uh, new models, and people are really working on that in community ecology as well. It's a, uh, it's a pity we don't have more time to actually talk about more new models. And uh, yeah, so the abiotic environment and other plankton groups likely drive more the population dynamics of plantonic foraminifera than just the self-limiting idea from macroevolution that they are, that that their diversification is just related to their no own number of species. And therefore, I found sort of a mismatch between the patterns we found in the fossil record and in present ecological communities. And this was published in the beginning of next year uh, with Breno also, that should be here. So if you're interested, you can read more about it. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Thanks, Penny. I'm very glad to see this work <laughs> thought out. Uh, could you go back to the, the first comparison that you did with mm -hmm. the, um, what was it, the over dispersion, under dispersion figure? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, the next one. Yes. 
the results. Ah, yeah. So I notice the, the shell size is always consistently, is that over dispersed? The, everybody's above the zero, right? Yeah, there's more clustered. This is more clustered. Okay, yeah. I thought it was more over dispersed. Okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. So there's a little. I, I invert. The, you can invert or not. Okay. Uh, so most people invert it so that the positive is clustered and the negative is over dispersed. It's just I just inverted the. Convention. So is is this meaningful in any way? Or is just this just. Um, this so you mean the, here, right? Yeah. The, the the fact that the shell size is always always clustered. Does that mean anything or? Yeah, so the, the most abundant species are actually bigger in average. So because I was calculating these for pairwise individuals and not species, I think that biased this, uh, or biased, or that's, that's the observed that in general they are, they are bigger. Yeah, is that clear? No, it's not. Other questions? I thank you for your talk. Um, during his uh, development, uh, this foraminifera uh, can change in, in shell size and must be relationship between different stages of the shell size of these individuals? Yeah, so, so a problem of these types of approaches is that you use a mean value for the population, right? Mm. You say that the, this is the average size of these species and this is the average size of these species and then when you, you're comparing just the averages. But actually you have a lot of very interspecific size variation and, and this is not taking into account in this mm. type of models. Is that your question? Or yes, yes, yes. Yeah? So in a null model that accounts that variation. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. We have time for a few more questions. When talking about the motivation to study plankton, you said that, well, their abundance is slower than you would expect to, uh, comparing, for example, birds, you said, right? Like the... Yes. Uh, general in the introduction, you mean? Huh? In the introduction? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, sorry. Yes, continue. Yeah, so uh, the idea is that the competition between plankton would uh, decrease the abundance more than, for example, birds do with, between themselves. Is that, is that it? Yeah, so, the, so it's not that clear in macroevolution what is specifically mm -hmm. the mechanism, but it's more, it's, it would be competition at the species level. Mm -hmm. Is that your question? Or? Yes. So the idea is that you would just have sort of a limited number of niches available for planktonic foraminifera types. And, and these niches are few. So when they are filled, a new species can only emerge when one species go extinct. So then you have this sort of equilibrium dynamics and they are competing for this niche space. That's the idea. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes, and do you know of a, an example of a clade that works like that, that it has the abundance like limited by its own between species competition? So Plantonic Ferminifera is an is a example of okay, that, that, but no. it's basically because the curve levels off mm -hmm. like this, but uh, we are not talking about abundances here, we are talking about sorry. species, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. and that was actually one of the ideas of testing it and seeing how that would then translate to abundance and how would species limit themselves in sort of this macroecological scale, which would be more comparable to the sort of macroevolutionary scale, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, makes Thank you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay. Any other question? Just since nobody else is asking, I have a very stupid and probably irrelevant question. But how do you, I mean, I, I, I don't expect that to affect things statistically, but how do you know that when you're sampling the floor, you, it represents the surface and it doesn't follow any stream or structure on the ground of the ocean? Maybe if there is a valley, things cluster there, and if there is a stream that pushes them there or things that statistically probably doesn't really matter because it's a lot of data, but how do you know? Yeah, so that's a great question actually, and I uh, and it's not stupid because I also did the same analysis by just sort of either sort of dividing the world into 
a grid and just either randomly sampling, sampling a sample or taking the average and nothing really changed. And so this, you could estimate how much they, when the shell, I think your question is when the, when the shell dies, that it doesn't really fall immediately below the sample, right? That it has a drift. And they have estimated this, that, that, that varies where you are in the ocean. So if you have stronger currents, you have more uh, sort of, these communities are actually somewhere else. But in the end, these communities that we observe, they're consistent with what we see in the plankton. If you average the seasonality out, no? that's also an assumption that when you use, the, when you use these communities of the seafloor, you're actually averaging out a lot of sort of temporal dynamics. And that is indeed a, sort of a, a bias of the data. And yeah, I don't know if I answered. Was that the question? You could do like sort of a spatial model where you would take into account all the currents and try to really construct back which communities are where and you could do that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. Any other question? First of all, thanks for the presentation, Marina. Uh, I would like to ask, so uh, you have considered as if size or phylogeny uh, is a proxy for competition between foraminifera. So uh, you also said that uh, not too much of the, their physiology is known. Yeah. What would another trait be uh, to, I mean, there, there was one slide in which you showed that they're not uh, over dispersed nor clustered. The, mm -hmm. Could there be uh, a trait for which they're in, in one of these states? Thank you. Yeah. That's a really good question, and uh, there might be a trait where, where you see more patterns. And one thing that I played around also, but it's sort of a binary trait, is if the species have symbionts or not. So that you would expect sort of species that have symbionts to have more similar sort of ecological strategy, and then if I would observe these patterns. And at least in the time series uh, analysis, I did not see any difference between comparing symbionts and non-symbionts, or within symbionts and within non-symbionts. So that I, maybe would be a trait. And uh, yeah, I guess that's the only other trait that I can think of that we know enough, and that we have data for all the species, because that's also so some of them have been a little bit cultured in the lab, and you know some sort of thermal uh, tolerances, but that's like five species of all of them. Be because you sample these and bring them to the lab, you either go to the very deep ocean, take a net, and they get destroyed, or some people actually in California and in Japan, they scuba dive with sort of glass pots and like try to capture them in the water column and bring them back to the lab, and they don't know how old they are, so it's really difficult, and it's really frustrating, actually. So, yeah. yeah. Any other question? Okay, let's thank Marina again. Thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here for the very last talk. <laughs> thank you for the patience. I'll try to keep it fast. Um, 
So my name is Deborah. I'm a postdoc, uh, postdoc researcher in Unicamp in the Physics Institute. Uh, and I want to show some results in this project that I've been working with, uh, with Professor Marcos Aguiar. He was here in the beginning of the week. Uh, I don't know if you're, people working in community colleges are going to uh, find some very uh, different approach here, but I think uh, my results are interesting enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in the beginning of the week, I talked that I'm very interested in mitochondria. Uh, why they're so interesting? The, uh, they are very uh, important for the cell because they generate the energy and they are responsible then for the respiration process. Uh, what is very interesting is that they have the, uh, their own genetic material, that's the mitochondrial DNA. And the, uh, this genetic material has very different properties from the nuclear DNA. Uh, first of all, it's uh, transmitted from the mother, so it's a haploid and non recombinant material. In general, of course, there is exceptions. Uh, it's a shorter, shorter chain and it has uh, hypermutability compared to the nuclear DNA. The mutation rates can be very much higher than the nuclear DNA. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's part of the respiration process. But in fact, you need genes from both the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA for the respiration process. So in fact, we have some kind of in genetic interaction here going on uh, that makes the, uh, to, that generates uh, interaction that's important for the respiration process. Uh, the importance of this genetic, ma genetic material has been uh, already been acknowledged by the community of evolutionary bi biology uh, as being recognized as a genetic marker for populations. But here I'm just going to uh, focus to an uh, uh, application that we call this barcode. Uh, as barcode, we mean that it, you can use a piece of DNA that can identify species. Like if it was a really a barcode like you pass in the supermarket. So you can uh, use a piece, a very specific part of the mitochondrial DNA to identify species. This case it has been used for uh, some decades already. And uh, it works really well for animals. Uh, there, uh, but there is this questioning. Why does barcode really work so, f so fine? Uh, and then there's this hypothesis why it's working and the, the most effective is because it's related to this respiration process that drives coevolution between the mitochondria and the nuclear DNA. Uh, since they have to uh, work together, they have to keep some compatibility. And since they have to maintain this compatibility, they have to coevolve. And what happens when you, they are not compatible? You would generate a, Problems in the respiration process that affects your individual fitness, since it, the respiration is really vital for the individual. Uh, to address this question, we have a special model organism that's being studied for several years also. It's a copepod called Tigriopus californicus. It's a very small arthropod. Uh, and it, uh, it has also, uh, it's been shown that like the genomic data on this animal has been shown that this coevolution between the mitochondria and the nuclear DNA is very nice data. And I just show here the most recent uh, uh, findings. Uh, then you, you have some populations, they are geographically distributed. They belong to the same species in the meaning that you can cross them and they generate offspring. But in some point, you generate the off, uh, these offsprings and then you do the inbreeding the offspring. You generate, generate uh, the second uh, uh, hybrids. They are not viable. And they are not viable mean, meaning because you have this incompatibility between the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA. So you have some, even inside the population, have variety of the mitochondria and the nuclear DNAs that can generate this, uh, what they call the hybrid breakdown. So you will suppose that this, in fact, is, these populations are in the early stage of speciation. They're going to uh, later become different species. Uh, we wanted to test this thing. So we want to really see how these uh, incompatibilities are really driving speciation. And the, if this is connected to the fact that the mitochondrial DNA can identify animals. Uh, they didn't identify species. To that, we, we start from uh, the very beginning. We, we use an uh, individ individual-based model. Uh, Aguiar, that's my supervisor, has worked with this, uh, with this model for some, some years already. 
he has some very neat, mod, uh, neat results in predicting biodiversity. So uh, let me explain step by step. Uh, we have a, a, a spatial, spatially distributed population. Uh, we keep it fixed size. And uh, there are two main restrictions when you have to do the evolution. Uh, your mating pairs has to be inside a neighborhood, so we have a spatial mating. And they have to obey some uh, genetic threshold of, uh, they have to belong to the same species, that's what I mean. Like, uh, each individual is described by a nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA that we very simply describe, describe as chains of zeros and ones. So each locus represents a, a gene that has two value of alle, alle, uh, zero or one. Uh, so each, uh, each genome of the nuclear or the mitochondria has the specific site, uh, the specific size, sorry. And uh, so if you get two individuals, they belong to the same species. If they, they when you compare the nuclear DNA, they, uh, they uh, respect this threshold, the G parameter. <coughs> They have at maximum G different sites. Once they belong to the same species and they are separated also in females and males, you, they can mate and they generate the offspring. The offspring is just generated by copying the allele from the mother or the father. The, there is a chance of mutation, uh, to occur a mutation that just flip the value of the allele. And then you generate the, the offspring uh, that don't, in generations do not, do not overlap. I mean, this is the dynamics of the of the uh, population, uh, the evolution of the population. The mitochondrial DNA you just copy from the mother, as we, it's just the basic assumption, and also has the mutational rate uh, probability. Uh, to check how the compatibility of these two uh, genomes evolves, we assume that uh, this DNA is gonna interact with this just by, in the first BM sites, and we, in our model, we say that compatibility is translated into the same value of alleles. When the alleles are different, they are not compatible. So we count how many of them are different, and then we call this the mitonuclear distance. So this is a measurement of the individual uh, compatibility between the, the, this nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we have a scenario that this is, we, these two, uh, genomes will evolve independently. So all the individuals can reproduce, I really, really like to reproduce, that we call the neutral scenario. But we can account for this nuclear distance, then we say that it inflicts a, a, a fitness in the individual uh, following a Gaussian function. So uh, in this, we, we say that when it, the distance is like zero, so they're perfectly matched, we have the maximum fitness of the individual, and as the distance uh, grows, the individual is less fit. It's always, we always do the normalization inside this mating neighborhood. So it just gives you a probability. The, the individuals that have a more matching between these two DNAs, they are more uh, probably, uh, prob more likely to reproduce. Uh, this parameter, the width of the distribution, you control the strength of the interaction. So we can vary for a very narrow that we have a strong interaction, so we just allow the individuals that are really high compatibility, have a, a really high compatibility to, to reproduce. Or when you go uh, wider, we, we, we just get closer to the new model that's the neutral scenario that the, the, this compatibility doesn't matter so much for the reproduction. So these are the parameters that we typically use. Uh, we follow some previous work and they know that with these parameters, we can see speciation in the neutral scenario. Uh, also, all the individuals in the beginning are all uh, uh, equal. So we start with all zeros in the genomes. So we have a, a test, uh, a platform that we see the radiation of species. Uh, we have all the same species and then start to speciate. Uh, and the, then we have a ground test to see if the mitochondrial interaction is a factor or not speciation, and then you're gonna test if the mitochondrial DNA is gonna identify the species or not. Uh, so these are some results in the dynamics. Uh, as this is the average uh, distance that measures the compatibility. So this is the strong, the blue curve is the str a stronger interaction case, and as I grow, uh, as I increase the, the narrow, uh, the width value, I just 
uh, follow to the neutral scenario that I call the no interacting case here. That's the uh, red curve. Uh, as we expected, uh, the interaction makes the compatibility keeps at low levels. And this has some, uh, effect, effect, uh, has some effects on the speciation. Here we keep the number of species and we see that the interaction has uh, uh, delays the radiation. So when you see the, the red curve is the radiation in the neutral scenario, it occurs uh, in the more early, the earlier than the, the case with interaction. And also the number of species in the equilibrium, and by equilibrium we mean that the number of species is constant in time, uh, it also diminishes. So we have two main effects caused by, by the interaction. Also we check how uh, the number of extinct species uh, this is the accumulated uh, the number uh, accumulated extinctions every, for every generation. So the extinction rate is just the slope of these curves. Uh, we see that the neutral case has the lower extinction rate, and the introduction of the, the, the interaction just have the general uh, hole of increasing the extinction rate. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, conclusions about the, how the interaction is affecting the. The, the dynamics of the population. Um, but we can see uh, a figure of merit that we can uh, take of all this process is to build the phylo phylogeny of these populations. So we keep the, inside the, the population, we can keep track of the most recent common ancestors between a pair of individuals. Then we can build the phylogeny of the population. So here we have the most recent species, and then this is like the most uh, the common ancestor to all of species, and then we can find some metrics here and compare the different process. From these trees, we can uh, analyze uh, following two main metrics. That's the alpha value that gets the speed of the, uh, the acceleration of diversification. It, means re it mainly relates to the uh, length of the branches in the tree or, and the balance of the trees. That's the second index. Uh, in general, the non-interactive case produce both balanced and balanced trees, and they are, most of all, have this alpha value around zero or negative values, so we have trees with very long branches. And when you have the interaction, the, 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 the topology of the trees change a lot. That's very nice see, a see signature. Uh, we, they have more balanced trees, and they have more short, uh, the branches are shorter. So uh, I didn't put all the values of parameters that I used here because they overlap a lot. So in general, really what happens. In this region, we have the metrics of trees related to uh, uh, processes with selection, and here are the neutral trees. Uh, but uh, my motivation was to see if the barcode, uh, barcoding of species work. As I said, in my model, I separate species by the, I use the reproductive, uh, the genetic threshold as a uh, as concept to separate the species. They can reproduce once they obey this, uh, this threshold of the G parameter. So as a reproductive isolation concept of species, to separate, uh, to try to do a, sim a classification of mitochondria, I cannot apply the same concept because the mitochondria is just cloned off from the mother. Uh, what I do to try to do the second classification through this, the mitochondria, I, I'm going to look for some similar threshold for the, for the mit uh, mitochondrial similarities. But uh, what I'm going to do is like this. I'm going to see how many species I get from the nuclear DNA, and I have a number. So I'm going to sweep the GM value till I, till I have the same number of type of mitochondria in the population and same number. Uh, number of species. And then I compare if the mitochondria classification uh, matches the, the species classification. And this, I ha this is the success rate of this, uh, both classifications. I eliminate all the species that have more than one type of mitochondria, or if you have two or more species that have the same mitochondria. Uh, so <laughs> in the no interact, this was very surprising for us. In fact, when they have the non-interact case, we have already a very high rate of success of the barcoding, around 8%. And in fact, when you introduce the interaction 
in the in this varying uh, parameter of the strength, it it just it makes in fact less accurate the specific, uh, the the identification. The average value has uh, kind of in the same order, but you have a, l a larger variation. So we, in fact, we are introducing uh, some noise. It's, it's less accurate identification. This was surprising for us. So in our model, the barcoding is not due to the mitochondria, uh, to the mitonuclear coevolution. But uh, as I said, we have to sweep this GM value to separate. So I'm, I'm going to take a look of uh, what's the threshold that I have to use to separate species in each case. And I see that when I have interaction, I uh, progressively have to diminish this, uh, this threshold to separate species. What this means? Here, of this mitochondria, of course, they are identifying species, but they are very, uh, they have a, l a large variety of mitochondria inside the species. Uh, so if you hear like you have a species that is identified by mitochondria, but they have like eight different sites. In this case, we have the, in the interactions is also identifying, but it's much more similar. You just allow to have 20 different sites. I don't know if people get it, but. Uh, so the result of this uh, is that even that uh, the mitonuclear interaction is not helping the, mito the barcoding to work better, it's helping to have the mito mitochondria more homogeneous within species. And this is more, even more significant in a kind of uh, ecological uh, view. Uh, to check uh, wh why then this working, uh, we can uh, do uh, some different approach. As I said, in my model, I have to have the mating restriction and the genetic threshold for the reproduction. I can do uh, some simulations without the special mating, but just without interaction, just a neutral case. And then I can check that it drops to half. So here we could see that, in fact, the barcode works in our model because of this this special structure of the population that's, that comes from this special, uh, the, the local mating. Uh, also, uh, we went a bit, a bit uh, further and we changed a bit the, the structure of the population, make some kind of 1D populations, keeping the same area. Uh, so this is the neutral case and this is the most uh, the stronger interaction case, as you want to call. As uh, we saw that there is a large, larger number of species, the, the trees are more stemmy, these are more teepy, uh, and there's a lot of uh, conclusions about this, this part that I, fortunately I don't have time to show here, but I can say to you that we analyzed the gene genetic patterns of the recent, uh, uh, recent uh, species, the most recent generation, and we could saw that the mitonuclear coevolution could promote the higher co correlation between the phylogeny, the spatial distribution, and the genetic patterns of the population. So in general, the mitonuclear coevolution uh, promotes the, the, we can see the history of species through the genetic patterns of the population. And we see that the final genome of the population, you can infer about the history uh, in terms of the phylogeny, and also correlates with the spatial distribution of the species. Uh, and this is, so as I said, so uh, the mitochondrial DNA is reflecting the history of species. This is a, a, a signature of conservation of genetic content. Uh, at the end, uh, just to, because this was my motivation, this, this Copepa, the Trigiopus californicus, uh, this is a, a distribution of populations. So I, I really uh, have to enforce here that these are populations, not species yet. They can inbreed. But this is how the, they dis are distributed in the coast of, uh, of the west coast of US. And it re really resemble a lot are the trees that we obtained, where you think that were, it was cool. So it, it really believe that we could uh, get in our model the main things that are, is driving uh, the evolution of this population. That's mean the, the geographical, uh, structure of the population and the, the mitonuclear coevolution. But we want to be more quantitative, quantitative about that. So <laughs> I show again the map of the trees. Uh, I show here two trees, right? Uh, this one and this one, this neutral and the 
case with selection. So here they are here. The neutral case is here. So it's really near that uh, the main data that I have before. It's following the, what we expect for the neutral scenario. The tree that we had the, from the simulations, it's here, is the square. So it also fits the, what we expect for, the tree, for trees with selection. And the tree from the, the empiric tree from the, the artropod is here. So it's really cool that the metrics are really uh, matching. So we, we think that our model really, at least for this population, is really capturing the, the, main, uh, the main mechanisms that is driving the evolution of this. OK, so take something hope message. Uh, we have a, a model to show how speciation is affected by the mitonuclear uh, interaction, give, leaving signatures in phylogenies, the special distribution and genetic patterns of the population. Uh, it was funny because we find that the, the barcode does not work because of this mitonuclear evolution, but, it's, but uh, we could show that it works at least in our model, because of uh, the isolation of the populations. Uh, and also, this is very cool that we find the mitochondria are more homogeneous within species when you have this mitonuclear evolution. And this is a signature of the conservation of genetic content. That's also a claim about the mitochondrial DNA. So thank you for your attention. This is my image if you want to send some. <laughs> We have time for questions. Can you say where the parameters come from, from the B and G? Who gives you these parameters? Ah, OK. Uh, well, it, uh, Aguirre has worked a lot with this model. In fact, we have a constraint that um, between uh, this, uh, this parameter for the local mate and the length of the genome. Uh, this is all based in the, the Higgs model. In fact, you can use like infinite chains, and then you can have like this S to be infinite in the uh, order of your population, uh, order of the lattice. But there is a constraint of how, much, how shorter you want to be this and how uh, large the, this mating range can be. Uh, we use this value specifically because we want to have uh, faster simulations. But we can see that we know how to change the things. In fact, what we want to hear is just to have a, a platform that we can see speciation. Uh, we know that with these parameters, we can see speciation in this, in this case. That was the thing. Of course, you can change a bit. But this is some kind of previous work that, from Arcos that uh, showed that. So it's not an experimentalist who told you those numbers. It's, it's just no, you. No, yeah, you it's chosen. just I modeling see. parameters. OK, yeah. thanks. Any other question? I have actually a question. Okay. So in the, uh, in the plot where you show this, the um, two properties of the trees, right? Oh. And you have the, yeah. yes, that's. Um, okay, no, it already answered my question. So my question was whether you could, I mean, because like what is cool about this is that you have a lot of empty space, right? <laughs> and so the question is, can you have actually network uh, trees that are in those empty space? But the answer is yes, because there are those points, so, yeah. okay. <laughs> in fact, there is a previous work from Mar Marcus, mm -hmm. and it was a, a cover of systematic biology with this kind of model working in different parameters and, and, and he was investigating how these parameters change the, 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 the regions that you mm -hmm. are in the plot. And it's also, uh, in this work, is really nice because he compared with real radiation. Yes. Hi, uh, it was very convenient to have these two talks one next to each other because you have <laughs> these kind of curves of saturating species. Okay. And I was wondering w what, what leads to this in this model? I mean, they're not competing, right? So it's just a spatial or a genetic limiting? That yes, yes, it's just, an, uh, it's, it's just the, you have just two, just a two constraints, the genetic threshold and this local mating. It's, it's neutral <laughs> in the sense. That, 
Actually, I think they are competing because the number of individuals is constant, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, but no, no, uh, not, not between species between because they just can reproduce with the species. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Any other question or comment? Good. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>